Show your support for the Untold Radio Network family of shows and join in on the conversation by using super stickers and super chats on YouTube. Got a question you want answered? Ask it live via a super chat and get real time responses from our shows, knowledgeable hosts, and guests. Help keep the Untold Radio Network shows running strong. We need your support. Send your super chats and stickers now. Welcome to the Sasquatch Outpost Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Myers. We are now season two, and we are episode 56 tonight. Glad you guys are all with us. I see our uh, our usual suspects are in the chat room. I appreciate you guys all being here. And I'm going to get to some of your comments later on in the show. Uh, I'm really excited about tonight. I'm really excited about the guest I've got tonight. I think you guys are going to be um, very, very impressed with uh, Fred and with the story he's going to tell us. And uh, it may change some of your perspectives about Sasquatch. A couple of quick things. We have officially launched our construction on our uh, Sasquatch escape room that's going to be upstairs at the Sasquatch outpost and I uh, right now I'm just doing demo demoing a bunch of stuff that was up there that we didn't need up there um, extra walls and stuff and I'm putting up new walls but here's my point uh, one we're really excited about doing this two if any of you would have some time that you're willing to donate and and if you have construction experience uh if you're an electrician um we could use some help and i, I will give you adequate credit for uh you taking part in us building the the escape room so if that applies to any of you in colorado or if you want to come from outside colorado and give us a hand I would say we're going to be building this thing for probably a couple of months is my guess. Um, so just throw that out there. If anyone's interested, we could use some help and uh, would love love for you guys to join in. And, oh, turn up my mic. Let's see. I can do that. I try to turn it down because it gets too loud. Tell me how that is, Patricia, from your side. Um, coming up soon, uh, we're going to be in Estes Park, as you know, for the Bigfoot Days event. And uh, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be interviewing, um, I think, Ronnie LeBlanc from Expedition Bigfoot at that event in the morning, 10 in the morning, something like that is when I'll be doing that interview. So... If uh, if you guys are there and you want to sit in on that on that interview, if you want to ask Ronnie some questions, uh, we're going to have questions from the audience, live questions. Um, would love for you to come in. Love for you to. I would say get there ten ish because uh, it's going to be packed. It was last year. I think it'll be packed again this year. 
Then um, I'll be at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference that Harriet McFeely puts on, and uh, that's in the at the end of April, so the weekend after the uh, Estes Park event, we're going to be in Nebraska, and then the we have the big conference on May 25th. So uh, that's which is going to be in Broomfield, Colorado, and I'll be speaking there with Jeff Meldrum and with um, the president of uh, Big Bigfoot Investigative Group. And um, so his name is Daniel, and Daniel will be speaking as well. So let's see what else I've got here. So those are just some things coming up, and um, we're having fun. I mean, we're we're uh, even though we're demoing, I'm trying to imagine what it's going to be like when we have this all finished. I'm trying to convince Stephanie to quit her day job and come work for me full time and help me with. <laughs> with the uh with the escape room because it takes someone who's there all day long i mean you have to watch people on the closed circuit tv and know where they are in the in the event and everything and when they need help um so it's gonna be fun when we get it all done okay uh a couple things i've got when when we were building the display that i've told you guys about um, with the 1962 f footage, we think, of Sasquatch here in Colorado, I had to remove some of the movie posters that we had up on the wall. So I want to give these away. And I will pay to send them to you. Um, so here's a, just be quick here. Um, now these, so this is one um, for the movie Exists, which, let me get it in the right way here. Um, not a bad movie. I mean, every movie about Bigfoot has its shortfalls and it's so, but this is not a bad one. Um, so here's the question and whoever gets this quick and, and don't cheat, don't go to Google. If you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer. So the question is what year was the Sasquatch outpost established? What year did we open the store that became the Sasquatch outpost? Anybody know that? And I'm going to be watching the answers here. Anybody know that off the top of their head? And I'll, if you want this, if you don't want the poster, nope, not 2010. Oh, Wayne, Wayne, you're disappointing me, man. <laughs> nope, not 19. Sorry, Debbie. Keep guessing. Keep guessing. Close, Doug. You're close. Who's going to be the first one to get it? It was... Nope. Doug was the closest so far with 2014. Nope. 2013. There you go, John. Okay. John will... I'll send this to John. If you will... Uh, um. Send us your address. You can do it through the contact form on the Sasquatch Outpost website and send us your mailing address. We'll get that poster to you. Sorry, Alonzo. John got it first. Um, okay, this is the second one. And again, these were all up in the museum for many years. This is the movie Abominable. It's funny how it, it's it got sections in it that, that on the green screen that... <laughs> are deleted but that's the and this is 11 by 17 so is the first one i showed um so question for this one was two weeks ago i interviewed jason and lou jason uh, frank and lou french and lou in the middle as he was telling his story um there was one thing they noticed as they were watching the video that surprised them so he told you about how he had to go relieve himself before he got in bed. Something that they saw in the video that surprised them. Um, see who can come up with that first. Not the not the orbs. It wasn't the orbs. It was something else that 
as they watched the video, they realized, oh, that's bizarre. You know, that that wasn't um, they they didn't expect that. Who can remember what it was that Lou said? Anybody? Well, Elvis is the name of the Sasquatch, I think, but that's not what I'm asking. If you remember, they watched the video, they got one viewing, and then it deleted itself. So the question is, what was it that surprised both Jason and Lou as they watched that video? I want to give this thing away. You got to give me an answer here. Somebody, I'm sure somebody's going. Yes, the time lapse. Wayne's got it. So Lou thought he would have been gone like five minutes, and it was like 15 or 20 minutes that he was gone, and they can't figure out where he was all that time. Okay, let's see. Okay, I got to think of a question for this one. This is a bigger one. This one is. 16 by 20 i think this is bigfoot uh at holler creek canyon i'm not even sure this is a real movie um some of these were just posters that were made um for fictitious movies but i'm going to give this one away regardless and i'll pay to send it to you but we ran out of questions let me think of a quick question here before i bring my guest in uh, let's see okay so this coming weekend i'm going to go camping with jason and lou and wayne maybe uh we're planning to go backpacking we go the same place every winter every end of march beginning of april wayne can't answer um who knows where this it's a it's a well-known trail that most people are not using this time of year and and it's in lost creek wilderness does anybody remember what trail that is and if nobody can figure it out i'll give you <laughs> i think you must mean cold as hell yeah it's very cold <laughs> it will be very cold The name has has a bird name in it, the name of the trail. No, not the lake that makes noises. That's a different place. It's in Lost Creek Wilderness. It's at the very back. If you know Colorado, it's at the very back of the Hayman Burn area. It's got the name of a bird in it, in the name. Oh, come on, somebody's got to get this one. Can I give you another clue? It's Something Creek Trail. Something Creek Trail. Daphne, you can't say. <laughs> Guess somebody else needs to get the poster. We've talked about this several times over the past year. Um, come on, somebody's got to get it. Owl Mountain. No. <laughs> nope. Anybody else? Uh, <laughs> okay, the bird is not the bird you would expect to have in the name of a trail back where this is. Pheasant. Nope. It's a big bird. Give you one more minute here, and then I'm going to need to go on ahead here. Nobody? It's not Pheasant Creek Trail. Yes, it does, Daphne. <laughs> no. <laughs> Eagle doesn't rhyme with noose. <laughs> You guys, somebody's got to get it. Ten seconds. You've get. I mean, the answer has already been given. Basically, if you just look at the clues somebody gave here, 
Moose bird. No, it's not the moose bird. All right, I'm going to have to give it. And I'll, I'll think of another question maybe during the interview here. It's Goose Creek Trail. Goose Creek Trail. It's not Ostrich Creek Trail. <laughs> you guys probably didn't know this. There's an ostrich farm in Bailey, believe it or not. And they send eggs to Japan for cancer treatments because they say ostriches have a prehistoric immune system. Didn't know that. Okay. All right. We're going to move forward because I want to give as much time as I can to my guests tonight. So uh, let's play our quick uh, uh, disclaimer and we'll bring my guest in. So my guest is Fred Roll, and Fred is a Native Alaskan and Native American from the Churyung tribe. He's a, uh, I may have mispronounced that, Fred, I apologize. He is on the tribal uh, council. Um, and I'm getting an echo, Fred. I'm not sure if it's from your phone or does anyone else hear that or is that just me? Um, I'm I'm not hearing an echo on this side. I, okay. If but, you guys, uh, the rest of you don't hear it, I'll live with it. Um, so, um, I, I heard Fred tell this story on Sibylla's, Sibylla Irwin's, um, podcast. And it was fascinating to me. I, I was, uh, I thought I need to get Fred on because this story has a different perspective about Sasquatch than we typically hear. So, uh, Fred, tell us a little bit about yourself, whatever you'd like our folks to know. Yeah. Um, it's pronounced Chilgyung. It's a CH sound. Chilgyung. C. Okay. Chilgyung. Yeah. And, uh, you know, life in Alaska is different in the village, you know, especially growing up traditionally, you know, subsistence life is, is not, uh, it's not easy. You know what I mean? So everything was treated, uh, you know, of course, with the utmost respect, everything had to uh, be accounted for as far as our safety, you know, uh, it, being dumb kids, of course, you know, we're running around just being crazy and stuff, but you know, we were fortunate to uh, have the village to raise. So if you messed up over at your auntie's house, you're, you're going to get your bud to you and also you get home, you know, and maybe someone along the way too. So, you know, that just that kind of upbringing and the subsistence life, it's, it's different than one might imagine because essentially what it is is if it's uh, you come across a game animal, ptarmigan, snowshoe hare, and you know, they're within season, so to speak. You know, they're not uh, wormy or whatever. We would normally take those animals and maybe, you know, have ptarmigan soup with the moose ribs or the caribou heart or, what you know, that kind of thing. It wasn't like uh, we all strapped up every day and went out, you know, grabbing game and stuff like that. It, it uh, Sometimes it gets romanticized in that way, but it was a lot more logical than that you know we would you know take game animals as needed and whatnot and you know of course the berry picking but the the thing that really stands out that uh, a lot of people weren't raised with is our oral tradition and a lot of people assume because it's an oral tradition that it's uh, full of mythology and folklore but that it, nothing could be further from the truth these are things that are told to us to keep us safe keep our bellies fed and, you know, so where we know where, where the game is, where the good berry patches are and so on. You know, I, I think a lot of people have romanticized that as well as some kind of folklore. And, and it's just not the case. Everything told us as kids was to keep us safe and to teach us, mm -hmm. you know, where, where to go for the good moose and the caribou, where they migrate and, you know, the good salmon catching areas. So, I, you know, I just wanted to share that 
because a lot of people do have it kind of misconstrued as far as what oral history really means. And uh, each family has their own histories. Say, yeah. uh, for example, the Johnsons, we'll call them. That, that have their oral, you know, just like family has our oral. And all is the umbrella of a lot of different things, the hunting areas, uh, the cryptids. You know, you got the hairy man, the little people, moose man, kushtika, uh, hell wolves. Yeah, and there's a list of things that, you know, and depending on the family, they may have more hairy man experiences in their oral history versus, you know, the neighbors. It may be more little people or, you know, <laughs> what have you. So, you know, there's that. It's we don't have a, a universal powwow, so to speak, and all the tribe comes together and we all talk about these things. These things are done within the safety of the home. Uh, usually uh, my grandma, she would, you know, get out the story knife with us kids and she would draw on the dirt with the story knife to explain things to us as far as where we're at, how we're growing up, you know, things of that nature. And mm. it's it's being lost. It, it really is. Mm. The, the kids nowadays, they would rather more technology, you know, that. So anyway, but yeah, sure. That's, that's basically what I want to share. A lot of people have a misconception that the oral history is just something that's folklore, and it's not. It's to keep us safe and, and keep us moving forward. That's why we're still here, you know. So that's a that's a great that. explanation. Um, and for those for those who uh, notice that um, Fred's um, voice breaks up a little bit. Um, he's doing this in his vehicle because if he does it in his house, his dogs pick up on his energy as he's telling these stories and they just go nuts. So, um, it's, yeah. it's just to, for, for and, Fred to be able to tell his story without interruption. Right. And also up here in Alaska, we get our internet by dog side. So. <laughs> There's that too, you know. It, uh, it it can be a pain doing doing live recordings. So bear bear with me. It's uh, yeah. I, I have plenty of bars. It's just Alaska. Okay, we will bear with you. And I'm not sure why I'm getting an echo on my end. I I tried to change something in the settings here, but it it didn't change anything. So um, let me just. Uh, oh, that may have. No, that didn't change anything. We're just going to have to live with it, those of us who are hearing the echo. So, um, Fred, the, the story that I heard you tell on Sibylla's show was incredible, for one. And, um, and why don't you set the stage? And let me tell our folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let... Fred, tell this story however he wants to tell it. And when he's done, um, save your questions. Anything you want to ask Fred till he's done with the, the story, because I don't want to interrupt it midway through. So um, be thinking about what you want to ask Fred at the end, and we'll kind of have a QA and a um, when he's done with the story. So does that sound okay to you, Fred? Yeah, that's that's fine with me. So this all started over prospecting for gold. Um, my elder, he spent a couple of years gathering up a portable sluice and some other stuff and making all the arrangements. You know, I, I've said it before, but the, the elders kind of dictate the flow and the pace and we're just the worker bees. We're there to, you know, basically do their bidding because it's viewed as we're learning as we're doing. It's on the job training basically to be, a, you know, a good villager <laughs> in essence that i mean that's what it boils down to so he made up all he got all the plans and we were going from dillingham up to the new yakuk river which is approximately 248 river miles from dillingham uh, we were in a 22 foot flat bottom skiff uh, we had a couple different outboards uh they were both 40 horse but one was with prop and one was with the jet uh, just because of the different depths of water we were going to be dealing with. And the Nuyakuk River has is, is got a lot of big rocks in it, and it's, it's fairly shallow in places. So 
it took us we left september 13th uh 2006 it was a day after my birthday um we were supposed to leave the day of my birthday but i requested with my elder that i could be in some form of civilization for my birthday and so you know he agreed we uh we left the next morning from squaw creek and it was a beautiful day you know it uh traveling by river it, you get cold up here in alaska there's no way around it it there's no good time of year to go swimming in the rivers. It's just not. It's too brutally cold. So, you know, traveling up river, my elder was in his mid to late 60s at the time. And we stopped in New Studiahawk for him to kind of regroup, get the chill out of his bones and whatnot. And we have family members there and stuff. So, you know, we, we were there a day or two. And then we stopped again in Kaliganik, got more fuel, and then continued on. We got up to where we were going, which was just outside of the Wood Tickchick State Park on the New Yukuk River, uh, seven to eight miles roughly. And so when we get there, it's a couple hours before dark. And we basically just went to work. My older one inside, he started cooking stuff. And me and my cousin, we started unloading the skip and, and everything inside. Um, you know, when when we're doing things like this with elders, if it was just me and him, we probably would have had some cold beers or something like that. But when you're doing stuff with the elders, none of that stuff flies. You, you know, you, you know, we were sober, we were quiet, we were just doing our jobs, you know. So we get everything moved in and, you know, he's cooking or whatever. And there was a couple hours before it was going to get dark. I wanted to go and scout for black bear but it didn't really work out that way it was too close to being dark and moving on the water at night you know when it's dark is just too dangerous so as we're sitting there uh he's basically we ate and he's sitting at the table and they're setting up to play cribbage he's dictating what he wants the next day you know i want sample buckets from over here of pay dirt and here and you know he's just running us through what he's expecting of us the next day now on our way up i had just bought this brand new remington 870 pump uh rifled barrel ghost ring sights it was going to be my slug gun you know for just the brush for bears and whatnot and on the way up i had taken a couple of cash shots on the way and it was off and so i was as he was talking to us i'm just killing time you know sitting at this little card table so let, let me paint the picture for you here when when you get to this place it was literally eight foot square it, i mean real small eight foot square it had this 50 style trailer attached to the back of it very very small uh it was a glorified box it, i mean there was nothing fancy about it it was a dried in shell with a little sleeping area in the back uh when you're at the river bank and you're looking directly at this place the door is up to the left it's all five eighths plywood and two by four construction i mean there's i mean literally nothing to it and plus building you can't have permanent structures in alaska uh per the state it has to be movable you can't build a permanent structure on state land you know that that's just not going to happen so these things were built on skids basically and so that's what we were staying in just dried in shell but it was only eight foot square so when you step in that door right immediately off to your left and tucked in the corner is this little card table two chairs and there's a window right there and mirroring it on the other side is a window above this little sink area and then down to your right as you step in the door is this little drip stove the little oil stove that was taken up of a fishing boat at some point and dead center on the back wall is the entryway into this little 50 stop egg-shaped trailer that was gathered onto the back of this place and there was all the windows were boarded up on the trailer because it was a, a blackout room basically because land of the midnight sun the fish and game observers used to literally have to sleep there and their job which i i, I find so mind-numbing they would have to come out climb up the tower and physically count fish one by one and that that's long practice it's it's long gone you know they don't they have that place hadn't been in use for probably a decade before we showed up it was just a dried in place for us to stay so as he's dictating what he wants of us and i'm adjusting that rear sight you know time is going by and stuff it was i would guesstimate about a half hour after dark 
and we're just it's just casual conversation all of a sudden the whole place just makes this this creaking sound like a stiff wind hit the place and it we would have known if it was windy this place it, it, i'm surprised it was standing you know what i mean um it, it wasn't the it wasn't the taj mahal by any means but we knew the wind was not blowing so something was off and as i look over towards my cousin where he's sitting he's closest to the window between his shoulder and the top of the window and these windows are 18 inches tall 24 inches wide that i saw movement over his shoulder and he saw the expression on my face and he stands up and he's like that's not funny and i'm like no no i, I saw movement out there and it's a salmon river there's spawn outs in the river so we figured there's a bear so we had this mill candle watt powered spotlight uh he grabbed the 36 i had a 12 gauge and our plan was to open this little chintzy door and run this bear off so uh, initially something seemed off but you know that's that's 2020 hindsight in the moment it just seemed weird you know that a bear would you know be that close with all the salmon in the water but anyway so we swing that door open and i beam off to the right hand side the riverbank side and we see nothing and we're literally a step out the door shoulder to shoulder uh he's on my left and i i start panning over towards our left and the tree line away from the riverbank is approximately 50 yards away and as i beam over we see three sets of eye shine and these things did not care that they were seen. They stood there. Uh, they were, I mean, this all happened real fast, but they were big. And the fence, I mean, like fence post markers, eye shine, it was big. It was bright, real, real brilliant. Uh, immediately, we tucked right back inside. All that that door had was a little J hook uh, and a little eyelet to keep it shut, right? Yeah, just bare bones i shut that thing and as soon as i hooked that little j hook there was this pressure um uh, i equate it to like your ears not popping on a plane to where the person next to you sounds like they're 10 feet away real weird muffled kind of sound and that muffling that sound lasted throughout uh it, it never varied it was always consistent it, it stayed throughout so I'm, my cousin's off my left shoulder and I'm talking. I'm looking across at my elders saying, hey, there's a hairy man. It's a little chaotic because I'm, you know, we're I'm jazzed up. My cousin's just kind of standing there and I'm trying to get his attention and confirm that I wasn't just seeing things. But in the course of all this, all of a sudden he's bam, he's right under that card table. I mean, in a heartbeat. Uh, he had the barrel of the 30 out six and it was like he was having a seizure almost the way he was gripping it. he had a death grip on the barrel and was holding it like a paddle and he's initially i couldn't tell he was looking across the room but after watching and looking over at my elder and we both looked down at him we realized he's looking across the room at the other window and i turn and i make eye contact with this thing now you gotta understand what what i'm seeing i i see from the bottom of the nose to the top of the eyebrow and it is it is one of the most shocking things that i i've ever witnessed i've i've been charged by bears i've dealt with you know various crazy things out in the wild but the shock that i felt when this thing looked at me um it, it was i the analogy i use is every fiber of my being wanted to run but it was stuck in my skin and so this thing looked at me and as it was starting to now understand i in that moment i felt like food there there was something in the energy in the way this thing was looking at me was i, I knew i was food it wasn't mind speak or anything like that it was just an instant understanding of where i was in that food chain and, and i was what was for dinner kind of thing right so this thing starts moving out of the way of the window 
And in my mind's eye, it, it was defend yourself, protect yourself. And offhanded, as I'm holding that shotgun, I shoot three times through the wall. And because of that muffling that was going on since I hooked that little J hook, it was just a thump, thump, thump. And there was a loud scream and the place shifted simultaneously. Now, when my elder cooked for us, he used this pot. It was like some salmon stew of some kind or whatever. But the, the scream was so loud, it reverberated in there. And that pot sounded like a tuning fork. And that, that movement almost took me off my feet. You know, I, I thought these these things were going to throw us in the river. That I mean, that, that was my initial thought. I thought we were going for a ride into the river. So as, as you can imagine, it was, it was pretty chaotic. My elder retreated into that little cubby area. Uh, my cousin was still under the table. He wasn't good for anything at the moment. He had wet himself. Um, he was he was babbling a little bit. And it was it was very shocking. Um, you know, immediately I took the one chair and put it by the door for whatever good that would do. And I took the other chair and I put the back of it facing that little cubby area with my elder behind me. And I sat there and so I could see both windows. Um, you, you know, sometimes when I, when I share this, it doesn't bother me too much. And other times it bothers me a lot. And so just, just bear with me if I, if I kind of babble a sure. little bit. No, um, take some time. There was, uh, as I was sitting there, uh, you got to understand, I was shaking hard, uh, very, very hard. My whole system was just jacked up. The adrenaline rush, I, I can't even put into words. Um, I sat there and I wasn't getting nothing from my cousin. I wasn't getting anything from my elder. Uh, there was, there's portions of conversation I had with my elder. I'll just omit that because it, it, it just really has no bearing on what happened. Um, so I sat there. And I'm just in my mind's eye, I'm imagining how these things are going to smash the place up and smack me against a tree. Uh, I, I was envisioning all the ways they were going to kill me or could kill me. And the only way I could stop like shaking was I, I resigned myself to death. I, I I didn't see the other side. I didn't see the the end of this other than me not being here. And so once I did that, I was able to stop shaking really hard um that that portion of me basically resigning myself to death it uh in, in a lot of ways it took a whole lot of joy out of my life since then but you know i i can address that later anyway so once i did once i was able to like genuinely understand i was a dead man um i stopped shaking like a leaf i, I was still gripping that shotgun so damn hard the the amount of mental fortitude it took to let go of that that pistol grip to pump the stupid freaking Coleman lantern white gas oh god I hate those things to this day I still can't have a bright light like bright white light above my head or hear that hissing of those lanterns it, it's a bad trigger for me but I sat there for more than a handful of hours basically by myself. Um, trying to keep it together you know there are several times i wanted to lay down um I, I tell you when a moth would hit the window jim holy shit man so so uh, you felt you, know, you felt like you had to hold it together for your uncle and your cousin at that point i, I was hold honestly they they were there but this was self-survival it wasn't uh, i wasn't a hero it was all get off me don't yeah i i want to live through this kind of thing it, it was like they were I, I didn't feel like i was protecting them I, I it was more i was trying to live if that makes sense i, I was yeah. i'm no hero in this mm -hmm. uh, i when i shot through the wall it wasn't to save us it was get off me it, it you know what i mean so i, I want that clear I'm, I'm not no hero um it, it was very very traumatic so I mean, hours go by and eventually my cousin 
you know, I use the expression, the cheese was sliding off his cracker hard. Um, it, it's a bit harsh, <laughs> but that's the reality of it. He, he would, he would babble um, some of the things he was saying. I, I, had, I coached him back to talking to me. I, I told him, hey, you know, I shot it. It ran away. We're, we're safe now. It's gone. It's gone. So over the course of some time, I got the rifle from him. Initially, I tried to grab the rifle after I shot through the wall and I was getting a chair set up. But he had such a death grip on it. I, I didn't want to accidentally shoot him because it was loaded. You know, we were just outside, you know, looking for the bear, what we thought was a bear. And so once I get him like back with me, so to speak, to where he's talking in like current conditions, current times and all that, I, I asked him what happened. Why, you know, did you see what I saw outside? And he was like, yes, I saw that. And I said, why, why were you under the table? And what he explained to me was, is as we were inside the door and he was off to my left, just, you know, less than two feet, he had a different point of view of that window that I eventually saw this thing at. And from what he said, when he looked out the window and noticed it, it showed his teeth at him and that he lost, he lost it. Uh, he said he felt like he had no control over his body and boom, he, you know, he went under the table. And he said when he fell under the table, he was trying to warn us it's there, it's there, but he couldn't talk. And that's why it looked like he was having a seizure, you know, the way he was, you know, locked up like that. <clears throat> he said once it showed its teeth and he fell under the table, that's when it came closer to the window. And then a moment later, we turned and saw it. So this thing was actually further away from the window and then came in closer once he fell under. And then I turned and seen it and, and fired through the wall. Um, so we got him changed out of his clothes. Uh, he had wet himself, you know, and it, it was it was really, really hard seeing. Now, again, we were lifelong subsistence hunters. We were like three peas in a pod. You know, we've hunted walrus together, beluga, moose, caribou, the whole gambit. You know, uh, we were always doing these things together and to see them in that state was very, very difficult in the moment, you know, um, because that same cousin stood shoulder to shoulder with me with the charging sow, you know, she was over 800 pounds. She was going to kill us, but he stayed on point and helped me put her down, you know? Um, so if anybody I thought would hold up, I thought, you know, he would at least, but mm -hmm. you know, I, anyway, that, that's irrelevant at this point. So we get him changed out uh you know time at this point is really uh it's a little murky you know what i mean i i, I can't say it was just 20 minutes we had him changed with this and that. it could have been 45 it could have been an hour you know it, it time really wasn't the issue uh it, it was dark outside and we all agreed we needed to go we need to get out of here and our only means to get out is the skiff now, outside the door to the skiff, it's 20 feet, and it's about a six, seven foot drop down to the little landing area where the skiff was. When we got there, we had the bow line, which this skiff was set up for commercial use during the salmon season. So it had a real long anchor line and bow line. You know, it was a good like 50 to 70 feet. So when we initially got there, we drug that anchor and dug it into the tundra. And so we're basically tethered off, right? And there's about 12 feet of chain before the regular rope starts on it. So we're, we're discussing all these things. Um, he brings up, let's use the big spotlight. We'll spotlight out the windows and see if we can see them, right? And, you know, I, yeah, I agree because I, I really wanted to get out of there. Um, it was super dark outside, though. So, you know, the initial plan was we would drift and let the current kind of take us down because running an outboard we're more than likely going to hit something potentially fall overboard you know that that kind of stuff so we had to kill that lantern because of the mirrored effect uh yeah i'm sure you've been in the cabin with the lantern going with no curtain it's a mirrored effect on the inside right so we kill that and we're beaming out the riverbank side first and there's there's absolutely nothing and, and believe me we are looking real hard we don't see anything. And then we go to the side of the wall where I shot through the wall and we're looking out that window in the direction. We saw the three sets of eyes shine and we're, we're looking, we're not seeing nothing. 
and as we pan back the off the back corner of this place you know uh kind of at a 45 degree angle there's an old outhouse that's not been used in god only knows how long right now everything there was made with minimal cuts so whoever brought the material was probably pre-cut and they just screwed it together or nailed it together or whatever but as we pan back to that point there was nothing until we got there and this figure was behind the outhouse now the outhouse is about eight eight and a half feet tall and it came up to what i would guess is about mid chest on this thing and it wasn't immediately up on it it was it was back off of it a little ways but it was pitch black um you know it had to be 13 to 14 feet tall every bit of like five and a half feet wide but it was so dark it was absorbing the light um it gave no eye shine back there was no sheen off of the hair or nothing it was just like a big black nothing and it, it felt like it was there for us, you know. Um, hmm. Hmm. We we killed that lamp or that that spotlight, and we all were back in that little cubby area, as I call it. And now we got barrels crossed. Uh, it's pitch black. No one's making sense. Everyone's talking at once in, in hushed whispers. Uh, it, it's it's chaos. It, it's literally white knuckle terror. Um, it, it was, uh, it was definitely difficult and very difficult. Um, fear on that level is so much different. The, the primal fear is far different than just being startled, watching a scary movie or getting the creeps. It, it's totally different animal. <clears throat> um, so it was dead quiet, you know, because the reason we killed the lamp or, or the spotlight was this thing moved just a little bit. And, and you know, we weren't trying to find out where it was going. We, we killed the light and it's back. But as we sat there, um, it was so quiet. And, you know, the kind of quiet you can, uh, I heard my heart beat in my ear because, the you know, the blood pressure was going. I could feel it pulsing in my eye. So I have been there and being quiet. We we calm down, and as you know, as it's quiet and we calm down, we start discussing this this game plan of getting the hell out of there again. Now, for a, a brief little while, we used some light to gather up ammo and some other stuff, and then the light was killed, and we were sitting there. Now. As we were sitting there and still discussing what we were going to do, it, it had to have been just, gosh, a few moments after the light went out. Off in the distance, the near distance, it sounded like rotor wash, like a thump, 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 thump kind of sound. Real, real loud. But we were feeling it in the ground at the same time as it got closer. It was one of these things run by. And once it ran by, it was like there was other ones around and they all started running different directions and stuff. And you could feel each of them weighed a different amount by the impact you could feel on the ground. It was like a herd of buffalo running by, you know, it was it was intense. So, again, you know, white knuckle terror, barrels crossed, mumbling. Uh, it, it was it was chaotic. Um, like. You know, my cousin, he, he, there's this nail, this rusty 16 penny nail we've been kicking around since we got there. You know, it's probably been there since the place was built, you know, it was all crooked and stuff, but he started talking about, let's nail the door shut. And I'm like, look, man, stay with me, stay with me. Cause that 16 penny nail ain't doing nothing for what we got going on here. Just stay with me. Cause what what had happened when they were running around is they would run around and then it seemed like they would back away and then they would do it again they did it about three or four times but the second time they did it we could hear one of them sniffing the outside of the trailer um to this day my dog's coming up by me and sniffing by my ears Ooh, i can't i can't can't handle that um it, it's I instantly get a cold sweat when I when that kind of thing happens and whatnot. So anyway, just utter chaos, 
utter chaos. Um, but it's hushed. We're, we're, we're so scared. We're, we're not yelling over each other or anything like that. It's just, we're three having separate conversations and, and none of them are matching up, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, after it got quiet after that, you know, time passed, it was dead, dead quiet, like so, so quiet. Um, we started getting confident again and started rehatching this escape plan. And, you know, I'm, I'm telling my cousin that, that we're tied off, take my pocket knife, you know, and our game plan was he would go first. I would be behind him with the elder behind me. Uh, my elder had a shotgun as well, but he had one of those old wingmasters, just a monstrosity of a 12 gauge, man. It was a beast. But we took all the bird shot out of that and I loaded up a bunch of my slugs in it. And as we were, we're trying to get this game plan together, um, at this point in time outside, it's just starting to lighten a little bit. You know, it, it's, we're, we're getting closer to daylight. So as, you know, as we were sitting there, some, you know, that, I felt toyed with. I felt like every time we were getting the gumption to make a move on something, a different form of terror would happen. Something else would would stop our our progress, so to speak. And it almost felt like they were feeding on our fear almost. Like as soon as we calmed down, something else terrifying would happen and and cause us to freak back out, you know. Um, again, that's 2020 hindsight, but I, I really felt messed with in those moments. So as we get this game plan going, he's supposed to cut the bow line because we're tethered off. We're, we're not going anywhere unless we cut that line. And, you know, he's got the knife. We're discussing the ins and outs of it. You know, everyone's got the important stuff they need. We had already uh, stuffed our pockets full of ammo, you know, already so th that portion of stuff was already under control and we weren't taking nothing um everything was was going to be there you know we we had no i wasn't going to take the time to load it up and i know neither one of them were going to either so as we're sitting there it's getting lighter out so our confidence is really really building right so as we're initially going to make our break for it um we're we're talking quiet hushed whispers about don't forget to cut the bow line don't, you know this and that i had the i had the 30 out six at this point my cousin had my my 870 and i had that wingmaster shotgun slung over my shoulder um and the game plan was he was going to jump down fire up the outboard after he cut the bow line and i was going to help our elder down the bank and then i would you know keep cover while they're firing up the boat and all that and then join them so we're about to execute this plan and all of a sudden it sounded like a pellet gun someone firing a pellet gun at the plywood it was this stack real loud and it was a slow cadence at first and then a hailstorm it was just <sighs> freaked us right out boom we're right back into that little cubby hole again barrels crossed just it, it, it was it was sheer chaos so it goes dead quiet after the hailstorm of rocks uh You know, there, there's a portion that I, I, I rarely share, but my elder in in those moments had made the comment that he thought he, he was going to have a heart attack, you know. Um, so with that, that terror going on, we also had the potential, you know, cardiac event of my elder. You, you know what I mean? So there was there was a lot of dynamics going on at the same time and they were they were all crucial you know what i mean it, it was all very very traumatizing um to say the least so it quiets down after the hell storm of rocks um it stays deathly quiet and with the quiet and the time it, we get more confident okay it's lighter out now we can easily see the tree line we can easily see the river so daylight's on our side now and so we look out the windows you know um we 
saw nothing. There was, I mean, nothing around. It was dead quiet. So we stack up on the door like a SWAT team, man. Uh, my cousin's in front of me. He's got the shotgun. I got the 30 odd six, that, that monstrosity of a 12 gauge over my shoulder. And I say, go. So we flung the door open and boom. It, I mean, it, we were moving quick. It, it was like we studied this our whole life and we had practiced it daily. You know, we're at the river's edge. He jumps down. I immediately set down the 30 odd six and helped my elder come around because it's a cut bank and there's dew on the grass. It, it's kind of at a real steep angle getting the footing. So I, I'm helping him get his footing. And as I'm leaning down to help him, as he, you know, negotiates going down this, this steep little embankment, that stupid shotgun that I got slung over my shoulder is pushing into the ground, kind of pushing me forward a little bit, right? And so once he's got his footing and he's good, I grab the 30 out six and I scoot back about maybe four to six inches. And, and all this is happening real, real fast. Uh, I scoot back and I stand up. And when I get to full height, this rock, a little bigger than a basketball, whizzes by my face. Um, hmm. it, it would have took my head off had I not scooted back that four to six inches. So immediately I lock onto that rock as it flies by and everything's slow motion at this moment. And I watch that rock impact the Nuyakuk River in a spot that was about three feet deep. And this rock hit so hard, it hit bottom and made a loud blasting sound before the water could close over it. Uh, and this is a fast moving river, right? It's the, the largest tributary to the Nushigek by volume. It, it's moving water, right? And so immediately I turn to my left cause that's the direction the rock came from. And at that distance, that rock had to have been already coming towards me as I was standing up. So they, this thing was anticipating where I was gonna be. I just by happenstance or God's grace, I scooted back four to six inches and stood up. Otherwise I would have stood up right into the impact zone, you know, so to speak. Anyway, so I, I swing over to my left and there's that big black nothingness coming out of the trees. Um, it was real creepy because how it moved, you you couldn't see it articulating its limbs. It was like, a, like an old Dracula movie, how it comes out of the fog kind of floating. It was that kind of movement. Um, and immediately, uh, with no eyes or visible head to shoot at, I shot, put three shots on it with that 30 odd six center mass. Um, a 30 odd six ain't nothing to play with. This identical gun, you know, uh, we killed walrus with this thing. 2,000 plus pound walrus, a shot or two, they're done. You know, even with the 180 grain, you know, soft tip core lock. I, I, <sighs> I heard the bullets impact this thing. Um, so I put the shots on it. It just stops moving forward. It doesn't flinch. It doesn't, uh, no knees buckling, nothing like that. It just stood there. It stopped moving forward and that it was go time for me. I, I jumped down the bank. My cousin didn't cut the line. At this point, he's got the motor running. So I'm yelling. I slide the 30 odd six into the bow. I'm like, give me the knife, give me the knife. He, he throws the knife. I cut that bow line and I notice my shotgun is on the ground and you know, everything's happening so quick. I start putting the chain into the, into the bow of the skiff. And my cousin's got the idle real high uh, because the outboard was cold. And I'm, I'm yelling at him, idle down, idle down. Cause he was trying to shift at the same time. I walk over and my elder is sitting on his butt on the edge kind of doing the slow swivel thing and i shoved him in uh he he bruised his wrist pretty bad uh but it, it was time to go like we had to go so i when i shoved him in when he landed uh he immediately swiveled on his butt to face back towards the bow so my cousin and him are both facing back towards me and i'm yelling trying to get the rest of the chain in i'm yelling at him idle down idle down and as soon as he idles down enough and it shifts all of a sudden their eyes get big as saucers and they're, they're looking up past me up on the bank. So as I'm pushing off, you know, at that point, the shotgun was irrelevant. All that stuff was irrelevant. You know, I'm pushing off and I'm looking over my shoulder and I saw up to about the knee on this thing. And what was odd about it, what, what really stood out because 
some of these instances are, aren't like a, a fluid motion. Sometimes it's more like a picture, 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 picture kind of thing, it, like little snapshots of stuff. And I think that was from all the adrenaline or whatever, but I could clearly see it had really dark hair, but the tips were like a reddish brown kind of chimpanzee orange, if you will. Um, real odd looking. It reminded me of a rose hair tarantula underneath the light, but with uh, without light colored uh, tips on the hairs, but, you know, reddish brown. So as he backs up, I, I'm. I, I fling myself in the bow. I got the 30 out six again. I got the bolt open and I'm putting rounds in because it only held four. And so I just shot three. There was only one round in there. So I'm, I'm looking for 220 grain at rounds. I'm looking for just to load the gun up. Right. So he backs up. And as we start moving forward at this point, tunnel vision is just really, really kicking real hard. And so we're, we're swerving, we're swerving back and forth. And it, I thought he was trying to break surface tension and get up on step. What I found out later, and this is just less than a handful of years ago, I found out they were actually throwing rocks at the outboard as he was doing that. He was swerving to avoid rocks being thrown at us uh, to disable the outboard. Uh, there was a huge dent in the transom, uh, cracked the cowling on the outboard. But in my mind's eye at that moment, I was so tunnel vision staring down into that open bolt, trying to shove rounds into it. Um, you know, honestly, I, I had it already full and I'm trying to force another round in it. I, I, it was just so it was chaotic. Right. And so as we're swerving back and forth, a couple times I glanced up, there was movement. So let, let me back up just a little bit. When I turned and I saw this thing coming out of the trees, at that point, everything was starting to tunnel vision, right? Uh, because of the adrenaline and everything. There was movement on either side of this thing in the trees, okay? It wasn't just him coming out. It was just he was my focus because I assumed, um, I don't know if it was a he, but it was massive. I assumed he was the one that threw the rock. And so when I, when I focused, there was movement. And so when I'm in the skiff in the bow and I'm glancing off to my left every you know few seconds or however it was, um, I did see movement, but after a while we were up on step and there was no other movement around us. Um, it, I was, I was so tense for so long, um, that once we were clear and, and the adrenaline wore off and stuff, it, it felt like I weighed a thousand pounds when, when we got to where the New York uh, is at the confluence of the, the Nushigak river. I, I was, I was done. I, I was so wiped out. It, I felt like I weighed a thousand pounds and none of us spoke about what just happened. Um, damnedest thing. It, it was just, just quiet amongst us. And, uh, yeah, uh, up until that day, I would have said these things make noise. You leave, you're good. Because in our culture, we don't we don't follow them. Uh, it's you know we were always taught when we we're young the hairy man will steal you and eat you. It wasn't to scare us; it was a fact. You know we have five hundred to two thousand people missing up here every year. Yeah, and I'm not trying to cast dispersions and say oh the hairy man got them all. I'm just saying. Our oral history dictates that they steal us and eat us. You know what I mean? So, but up until 06, I would have said, eh, they make noise. You're good. You leave. Nothing to worry about. But that night changed uh, how I viewed so many different things out in the wilds of Alaska. That's for damn sure. Well, that, that experience would change anybody, Fred. I mean, that was obviously a life-changing experience so um and as you're telling the story i'm thinking to myself i haven't heard stories of aggression like that down here what would you attribute that to do you think there are different type of sasquatch up there or what what are your thoughts well i i think it's environmental man we we have less than a million people like 780 some thousand statewide in a state that's large enough to fit 19 other states. 
Okay, so you you, you got to keep it in context. Alaska is vast, so you got limited, you got extreme environment, limited season, and a very limited time to gather these resources. And we were on a salmon river. We're by large berry patches. We we are we're in direct competition, is what it boils down to, and it, that it's a very stiff competition because of the environment you have such a short season so i think all those play a part hmm. and it, it you know even the experiences shared with me for the most part the people are freaked out and they leave but you know that experience on the new year cuck uh that's uh, i'm not unique in that there's i i, I mean dozens of people who have had similar experiences on that river uh and i found out much much later you know much longer after my experience um several different people that i i knew for a very long time they didn't never talk about it either but they had similar experiences where they had to put shots on these things to back them off so they can escape um that nuyakuk mm -hmm. river is a son of a bitch man uh the, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's, you know, there's there's large deposits of gold and copper up there. I don't know if maybe there's something in the energy, maybe ley lines. I don't know. But there's there's something that is so hyper aggressive in some of the areas up here. Um, it, it's I, I wish I had an answer uh, better than that, uh, because I'm still trying to figure it right, out, to okay. be honest with you. Right. I have so many unanswered questions just you know, for myself, like, why didn't they knock it down and tear us out of there? Uh, how in the hell did that thing withstand three shots from a 30 out six? Uh, just a, a whole litany of things, you know, a weird survivor's guilt, if that makes sense. Even though no one died, it, there was this weird, I, I think it stems from me resigning myself to death and uh, because I genuinely, uh, in my heart of hearts, I didn't think I was going to live through that. I, I really didn't. Um, and I'm happy right. I did. Don't get me wrong. But I lost a certain zest for life at that point. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to put into words, but it, it was. Uh, it changed it changed a lot of things for sure. It ruined my relationship with my relatives. Hmm. Um we haven't we haven't talked in a long time my elders since passed um so yeah i i have a totally different view of these things from that i'm biased uh, i got no gifts except high velocity heavy caliber um i i don't i don't trust anything about them but again because of what i just shared with you my my views on it are are a bit different than the average person's you know Wow. Wow. That's all I can say. Um, there's there's a few questions that folks are asking. I'll let Stephanie put a few of those up and see how you want to answer. The intents of the Alaskan forest people, could they be a different species or a different tribe than those here in the lower 48? I, I mean, it's possible. Um, you know, it, it, we're, we're, of course, it's all speculation because we don't know. Um, but the ones I saw were re robust. Uh, I've seen other ones, you know, in years past, uh, some look like Chewbacca, you know, just kind of tall and lanky, uh, a lot bigger than Chewbacca, of course, however, but that kind of stature, kind of lanky NBA player, uh, to ones that are a lot thicker, bigger, um, way more robust. I'm, I'm talking that, that black one. It, it was absorbing light, but it, it was the oddest thing. It it had depth. It had you could tell it was massive. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's a different tribe thing. Um, I think it's it's mainly environmental. Uh, I I think the extremes up here. It, that's just what it equates to. You know, you got that that difference. Did you did you have nightmares after this, Fred? Oh yeah, oh hell yeah, I still do sometimes. Um, for four years straight, uh, you know, I, I would self medicate as I call it. You know, I, I fell into a bottle for a little bit. Um, 
you know, there, there's the, the biggest thing for me was the, uh, losing my family. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be, you know, you, I, I know for a lot of people, they're like, oh, family, whatever. I, I get that. But the way we were raised, we were very, very tight knit. Uh, we were three peas in a pod. And in this incident that no one asked for, like demolished all of that. Mm. Um, mm. I, uh, you know, I, I, I said some pretty hellacious things to my loved ones that night um, it, because they weren't helping me. Uh, I'm sure that didn't help. You know, there, there's a lot of regrets when it comes to that aspect of it, you know, because I felt all alone and I'm, I'm yelling at them, you know, trying to get them to pick up the gun, help me, whatever, whatever they were going to do. But it, I just felt so alone, even though they were feet away from me. Um, but, yeah, it, it uh, I had nightmares for four years straight uh, with you know, fell into the bottle for a while. And, uh, still to this day, it, uh, it affects me for sure. Yeah. What, what year was this spread? 2006. Okay. It was uh, a little over 17 years ago. There were some other questions here, Steph. Can you, did you ever hear them communicate vocally during the assault? You know, when they were running around the place, there was noises going on, but we were locked in such terror. I couldn't tell you what those noises were. I just, the only distinct sound I heard was that snipping on the outside of the trailer. Um, there was definitely a lot of noises. I, I, I just, I could not honestly tell you what those noises were. They could have been having full-blown conversations with each other, uh, but I was so lost in terror. I honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what, what was being said, but there was definitely noises going on for sure. Hmm. Did you ever go back? No. Um, I, I want to make a documentary and I want that to be the place, uh, the apex of the documentary, so to speak. Um, I, I just haven't because of sheer logistics i mean even when you're in remote alaska you you're going even further remote so the logistics compile because fuel the distance you know the materials needed to get there you know the boat and everything um i, I just haven't had the means to to make it happen but i'm, I'm definitely going to go back uh i it bothers me and just just the thought of it but another part of me feels it will put a lot of things to bed um, as far as the, the things I deal with since then. But uh, yeah, well, if you, if you uh, go back, if you go back and you're filming and they come back, what a film that would make. Oh my God. Yeah. Cause I, I will have a security detail with me. Believe yeah, that. For sure. uh, yeah. And uh I mean, you know, to be determined, um, but that place, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, you know, because when I was told the Nuyakuk, I was like thinking, damn, that's way up there. You know what I mean? Because uh, typically we would go up to New Shigak, no further up than, you know, New Stuyahawk or maybe Kalignik every once in a while, Ekwok. But I never went that far. I've been to the Mulchatna, which is just below that on the New Shigak uh, quite a few times before then. But it was just so so distant you know and then i find out all these years later the actual historical impact of all these other people who have had to do the same thing i did just to get the hell out of there hmm. um you know it, it's motivation for what i do now sharing people's experiences and stuff and having that interactive map of alaska so my fellow alaskans or visitors can go there let's say they're going to kenai peninsula they could pull up the map and pick a marker pin and it's embedded with the encounter of, you know, whoever had in that area. So they have something to go by, you know, okay, over here, there was these weird alhoots over here, you know, it was tripping like a squirrel, whatever it may be. Uh, it, it's, it's a public service in essence, you know, be aware of your surroundings, like being bear aware 
Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone out of the woods. I, I'm not. I, I just, had I known it could go like it did, I would have definitely, I, I don't know if it would have changed anything in those moments um, because in 2020 hindsight, we were lured out. Um, that that was very strategic to make the place creak, you know, lean on it, whatever they did to make that noise. If we wouldn't have saw those three sets of shine, Jim, we would have walked right around that corner where that one was. Um, but seeing the three sets of eye shine and then the moment I shot through the wall, uh, I think that changed whatever initial game plan mm -hmm. they had. Mm -hmm. And again, 2020 hindsight, everything they did after that was to see if we were going to shoot again, the running by, uh, all that stuff, you know, it was to see if we were going to engage with the guns again. And I, I think, I could be wrong, but I think me firing on them immediately changed changed the whole dynamics of whatever they had planned. I mean, they they were planning an ambush, is what it seems like, and yeah, and the fact that they could take thirty out six rounds, the first one you shot at, and then the other one taking three rounds, I hunt with a thirty out six. You're right. Yeah, it's a it's a big round. And yeah, yeah, and you it's could, you could, business. could you hear all three shots impact on that one? Yep, sure could. You know that's that sound it. I'm talking about, yeah, like when you shoot like a, a big, like like a, a big moose, that, like that, a thark, thark. that yeah, yeah, that, that, mm. and you know, I so many unanswered questions, man. Like we killed walrus with this gun walrus, a big ass, bigger than a friggin' Volkswagen. You know what I mean? Um, a couple thousand pounds, like literally a ton and yeah. a shot or two from an odd six. They're done. They're toast. You know, um, it, it, it just, it's still that up until that day, a 30 odd six, I would have been like, you kill anything with that. I, I, I never used any other weapon outside of a 12 gauge. A 30 out six was my go to up until yeah. that point it, for everything. It didn't matter because it worked. It's a very sturdy, very powerful gun. Um, but, you know, uh, as they say, shit happens, right? Um, sure. I mean, it's amazing. So, I mean, yeah, it's amazing it, uh, they can take that kind of punishment and just keep coming back. Yeah. Yeah, cause uh, I'm I'm not bragging, but I grew up hunting. I'm a good shot, you know. I I don't uh, when it comes to marksmanship, I've always been up on the top shelf with that because I was taught one shot, one kill. You know, you you drop your animal where it's at. You don't want to chase it and adrenalize it, that kind of thing. You know, yeah. um, yeah. it just it, it was always like the way we were raised was always conservation don't waste your ammo don't waste your water don't waste your food don't don't waste you know always make the use of everything to its utmost and uh yeah anyway it, it yeah definitely it's it still bothers me for yeah. sure yeah let's let's put Sibylla's question up here for Fred. Have you ever heard of any other witness talk about the change in air pressure? Uh, a couple times. Uh, I, I can't remember which numbered videos they are on my channel at the moment, but yes, definitely a couple times. Um, and that, see, that's another thing. What was causing that earmuff effect? Because it, it, it lasted throughout until that rock impacted the water. It was earmuffs. It, it was pressure that whole time. Um, it was almost nauseating at times, you know, like when I was sitting there by myself, it, it was almost nauseating that pressure. It was, it, it wasn't a hum. It was just a, a, a pressure. It, it's, it's hard to put into words. It, it could have been infrasound. I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm speculating, but it was definitely consistent. It didn't vary. It didn't go up and down. It was consistent throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things about them that we don't understand, and you understand far more than I do. And there's so much that confuses me about them that you don't imagine 
what what we think of as an animal doing and so um right or or as people you know but um yeah that that's just i mean as i as i listen to your story and i think the chat is showing the same thing i put myself in your place and i think what would i be thinking what would i be doing different than what you did and i can't think anything probably i would be terrified terrified yeah yeah you know when you were asking me about looking out for family and stuff i, I was just trying to be sincere and honest no, i wasn't looking out for anyone but trying to survive and yeah, yeah. you know um i, I don't uh, it, it's shameful to say it in that way but that's the god's honest truth that's you know that's the reality of it um and hmm. Mm. <laughs> so how long did it take you to go back out in the woods that was a question someone asked oh i was i was out the following year and had another experience um we we were just below ekwok and uh we were going me and two other cousins we were um one of my cousins was the brother to his younger brother was the one under the table the year before but the three of us, we were going up to drop one of the relatives off for a hunting camp that was getting ready to start. And we were, we started late, you know, we left Dillingham, we were at the bar for a minute and we take off and we run out of daylight. And again, we don't usually travel at night. So we end up at this spot, had a big bonfire, you know, just three Indians whooping it up in the woods. Well, as we were sitting there chatting and whatnot about, 60 yards straight off in front of us we hear an owl hoot and it was it sounded like a natural owl hoot nothing out of the ordinary a moment later back behind us and up up a hill a little ways about maybe 100 yards we hear a response that was not an owl it was an imitation of an owl hoot that was much louder mm -hmm. And no sooner than that one sounded off across the river from us and we're at a point where it's about 80 yards wide another owl hoot across the river imitation very loud so loud uh, i i felt it in my pant leg uh it was creepy as hell and so in you know it was going around you know once that one sounded off then the first one sounded off again but it didn't sound natural at all that time it, it was very loud very imitation and it went in a circle and the one that was across the river because by this point we all have firearms we're stoking that bonfire you know because it's getting on in the pretty good darkness at this point we heard the one across the river jump into the water a little further up and we heard it splash across and once it got across we couldn't see it of course but we could hear it it was very loud uh this thing had to have been very big but what was creepy is when we heard it getting out of the water because it wasn't hiding it or trying to disguise any noises at all uh it did another owl hoot, but simultaneous with that owl hoot was this click pop. It was like two hmm. distinct sounds at once, it, 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 but each one was crystal clear. It, it was very, it was creepy as hell, but it was very uh, like, whoa, that, yeah, I mean, it was very intriguing how hmm. crisp and clear each of those sounds were, but they were coming from the same place at, at the same time. It was real hmm. weird. And then the other two responded just like that um, with the click popping with the owl hoots. And so what ended up happening is, is we had that fire so big that the little pop tent we had, which was about 15 feet away, it was starting to, it melted some of the guidelines. You know, I mean, we had a huge, yeah, we had a huge fire going. And uh, so we heard rustling in the brush between us and the riverbank and just off to the right hand side of our little path to the skiff and whatever was there we should have been able to see it but we didn't we but we heard the brush moving and so that was it for us you know we we grabbed our little bag of party favors of our whiskey and beer and, and we jumped in the skiff and we we drifted out into the channel and dropped the anchor uh we wanted to watch that fire so we didn't start a huge you know forest fire or whatever but we were also we had been drinking and we didn't really want to run the river in the dark because it was just too dangerous so we dropped the anchor and it didn't catch until a little further than what we wanted to but as we were out there sitting there 
uh, the demonic sounds coming from the woods. You you could see shadows move from the light of the fire, but you couldn't really make them out. It was just big movements here and there. All of a sudden, you know, some of the logs come flying out into the river and stuff with these <laughs> demonic sounds. And we just pulled the anchor and drifted on down to Black Point. Um, yeah, that, that was my welcome back to the woods, Fred. Uh, wow. And that... That particular area, I, I come to find out later from an elder from Ekwok, uh, that place is known for those those ones that those particular group of them. They they do the same thing to everyone who goes into that area type of thing. Again, I found out later. You know, um, had we known, I, I I honestly I probably wouldn't have gone on that trip. Um, it it was hard uh, because. I was putting on a brave outward face, but on the inside, I was screaming like a little girl. I wanted, I wanted to run. Um, but again, you know, when you're in those remote places, where do you run? Where, where are you really going to go? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, but I still go back out. Some days are easier than others. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things, you know? Well, as I, as I listen to you tell this story, and I take a lot of people out, Fred, it, it's making me sit here think, at the very least, it gives me pause a little bit, because the last thing I would want, or you would want, or anybody would be to have someone that you're with disappear. And, yeah. and and it could happen. It could happen. Um, I've I yeah. felt like the risk was fairly minimal here, or I couldn't take people out. But if I heard a couple of stories like yours happen in here, I might have to pack it up. I don't know. I mean, that's just uh, that's my emotional response to what you've been telling. Yeah, it's uh, but again, it's it's Alaska. It's different up yeah. here. You know, I, I hear, you know, like we we're talking before the show and you were sharing some of those experiences and stuff that those I mean, for me, they're, they're so far removed from what goes on up here. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it, there's a whole lot of uh, young ladies have been coming forward from the village and expressing how they were mind spoke to um telling them that the this hairy man wanted them for itself and you know all these different dynamics that i you know that wasn't even in my wheelhouse but you know these are coming from villagers and i can't just dismiss it because i, yeah. I know what it takes to come forward and share something like that is it's not easy you know so i you know with my youtube channel i, I treat it like i do our oral history just what that particular instance was and i leave it at that and i move on to the next one you know what i mean i don't try to flesh it out or yeah. you know yeah. add a bunch to it i just I, I leave it as close to what was shared with me as possible and i leave it for whoever <clears throat> listens to it to to take what they want from it um yeah yeah here's here's um his youtube channel and then he's got a website by the same name, Subarctic Alaska yeah. Sasquatch. Yeah, and that's with the interactive map. They can touch on the marker pins, and those marker pins are embedded with the YouTube channel, so it'll bring them right to the encounter video from that area. Um, that's, that's cool. Shout out. Cool. Yeah, shout out to Dave, the tech guy, for making that happen. He, he's a real <laughs> cool dude. I appreciate him. Um. Wow. I mean... We've had so many comments and questions. There's just not even time to 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 ask all of all of them to you. But Brett, I really appreciate you coming on our show tonight. I this is going to go down as one of my favorite interviews in the past year. Not because of what you shared. I know it was terrifying. Just because I I heard you tell the same story to Sibylla. And I've learned something that when if someone is lying, their story changes every time they tell it. And you told your story exactly the same way as you told it to Sibylla. 
And so I, I know this really happened to you and I know it's a, it takes an emotional toll for you to tell it every time. And I, I can appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on, Jim. I appreciate it. Some, some people are asking in the chats, Hey Jim, do you want to go visit Fred? And I'm, you know, hell yeah, I'd go visit you. I'm not sure I want to go out in the woods for a whole lot of time unless I've got a 30 out six on me, but, um, yeah, just, just, uh, phenomenal testimony and, and story. And, uh, I know you're going to get some new followers from, from this show for sure. Oh yeah. I, I appreciate it. Me, for me, I, I just want to get the word out and warn people because so many people, um, they may have a false sense of security coming up to Alaska and yeah. Yeah. I, I'm basically like, it might be nice and fuzzy where you're at, but up here, people are gone. They're missing. They're, they're no longer here. So there's, you know, something you got to take it a lot more serious. Sure. Um, sure. It just anywhere out here for any reason, Alaska don't give a flying rat's ass about you. Uh, you know, Alaska will swallow you up like nothing. Alaska does not care. I mean, I was almost stomped to death right over here, 20 feet away by a moose a couple <laughs> days ago. Uh, I'm, I'm dead serious. That's just a day in the life. You know, you gotta, gotta dodge the moose and not get stomped to death. Don't get eaten by the grizzly bear. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's it's survival that's for sure 100 percent. well um i think they it seems to be a different environment up there for sure and i agree with you and and i think the sasquatch down here see people a lot more a lot more and so that yeah. could have a lot to do with them just being more used to us for better or worse and uh right and also up here every time it seems like we we're meeting up with them is in direct competition for right. a resource and right. i think right. that adds pressure right. to the whole situation you know yeah no doubt yeah. No, no doubt, doubt. No. well fred i'd like to stay in touch going forward i I'm, i really appreciate getting to know you tonight so thank you again for coming on the show yeah not a problem man not a problem thanks for having me you bet We'll say good night. So this next week, um, thank you again, Fred. This was an awesome show. I love this. This next Tuesday, I'm going to have uh, Pamela uh, Pierce. That's her maiden name, who is the daughter of Chuck Pierce, who Charles Pierce, who was the creator of the Legend of Boggy Creek movie. And Pamela his daughter now has full rights to the movie and, and we're going to hear kind of the rest of the story about the legend of Boggy Creek and how that came about and um, the story behind the story, if you will. And Pamela is a, a great interviewee and it's going to be a, a great show. So get your questions ready for uh, the legend of Boggy Creek. Um, some of you <clears throat> said that I should put, um, Fred in touch with Doug. Um, Doug's getting interviewed, Fred. He he feels like I scooped him on this one. And uh, <laughs> I I had already asked Fred before I found out that Doug is going to have him on too. So I said to Doug, you're slow, man. You're losing it. You're slow. <laughs> it, it was very funny. But uh, I have a great relationship with Doug. Um, in fact, let me just put up that thumbnail real quick, Stephanie. Uh, Doug and I came up with a new thumbnail for our second season. This was the first one, obviously, with Fred. But uh, I'm going to start putting my guests' photos in. And um, So thank you, Doug, if you're watching this, for your help with that. And I wanted to let you guys know, those who are still we're going to start, I'm going to start creating content uh, videos that are different than the podcast. So the content videos will be, from the field, uh, out in the woods with Wayne, with others, uh, I'll start filming when I, when I take people out at night. So, uh, we're going to have a different, a different, um, venue for that on YouTube, but it will, it won't be Sasquatch Outpost podcast. It'll be something else, um, chasing 
Colorado Sasquatch or something of that nature. But just to let you know, those are going to be coming um, soon. And, you know, Doug just said, look, you're out there doing this stuff anyway. Just film it for, for everybody else. So we're going to do that and start posting those under a different header, but also under the Untold Radio Network. So, okay. Well, everyone, thank you for tonight. Thanks for all the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't give Fred everything. There were just too many. Um, but I know you guys appreciated what Fred had to share and, and uh, the emotion that that takes every time he does it. But uh, unfor- unforgettable experience. Well, have a great week. And until next Tuesday, keep on squatching.